Good morning and a happy Sabbath. It is an honor to have you join us for our virtual online church service. Welcome to Perry Beaches Church. This morning, we would like to take the opportunity to wish you well, health, and joy. As we consider what has been happening around the world, it is undeniable that we are living in perilous times. But I'd like to encourage everyone through the words of Jesus Christ that are found in the book of Luke chapter 21, from verses 25 to 28. The Bible says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And Jesus then says, And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. My brothers and sisters, inasmuch as we are seeing all these disasters around us, let us not lose heart, but let us remember that our redemption draweth nigh. So with that in mind, please, in the comforts of your homes, I would like to encourage you to take part in the song service and get out your Bibles and be ready for the message that shall be shared. And also, please, let us remember that we are in the presence of God and let us come boldly, knowing that Christ, our brother and our king, ministers on our behalf. God bless you. Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing lost, the Turns his face away as wounds which mother chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. A
dost only see. We may not be in the pencil's my Lord will have need of me. But if a still small voice he calls to pass that I do not know, I'll answer, dear Lord, in my hiding life. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, on mountain or plain or sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. Perhaps today there are loving words which Jesus will help me speak. They may be now in the paths of sin, so wonder what should see. Oh, say that if thou wilt be my guide, no dark and rugged away. My voice shall echo the message sweet. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. On mountain or plain or sea, I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. There's surely somewhere a lonely place in its harvest fields so wide. Where I may labor through last short day for Jesus the crucified. So trust in my own, thy tender care, and knowing thou lovest me, I'll do thy will in the heart sincere. I'll be what you want me to be. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, on mountain or plain or sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, over mountain or plain or sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be.
morning, boys and girls, and happy Sabbath. We continue our story this week with Moses' walk with God. But before I start this week's lesson, I want to thank you so much. I was so blessed last week when you shared your favourite parts of the story so far and you explained why. I was so blessed. So this week, this Sabbath, the title is Food in the Desert. Are you sitting comfortably? For three long hot days, the caravan moved on through the wilderness. People began to get tired and thirsty. The water they had brought along with them was almost gone. When children asked their parents for a drink, they were told they couldn't have one. Those in charge of the cattle began to get worried about what would happen to the animals if water was not found soon. Half a million men, besides women and children, can drink a lot of water on a warm day. So can thousands of cows, sheep and goats. Water would have to be found or they wouldn't be able to go on. By the end of the third day, many of the marchers were beginning to get worried. But presently, somebody was shouting far ahead, began to wave excitedly, water, water. The very sound made everybody feel better. Spirits rose, they pressed forward eagerly. Then came the disappointment. When the first to reach the pool stooped down to drink it, they found it bitter and quite unfit to drink. Quickly the word spread along the line. The water's bad, we can't drink it. Mara, or bitterness they called the place. Grumbling began. The people blamed Moses. Why had he brought them to this spot? Didn't he know that they needed water? Just thought, met Moses, who had lived in the wilderness for 40 days, didn't know about the water problem. What should we drink, they cried. As always, Moses took his troubles to God, and God had a way out. He pointed out a certain tree. If cut down and thrown into the bitter water, would make it sweet. Moses did as he was told, and the water became fit to drink. Next day the caravan moved on again and they came to Elam where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palms to provide little shade. They encamped there by the waters. Everybody was happy now. This was the first real rest they'd had since leaving Egypt. After all the excitement, the lack of sleep, the long march, they were just worn out. So they were very glad to be at Elam. It was cool, fresh water, oh, and the palm trees. Moses wisely decided to let them stay here for two or three weeks and then ordered them to pack their tents and start on their journey again. So on the 15th day of the second month, just six weeks after leaving Egypt, they came into the wilderness of Sin about a hundred miles down the peninsula of Sinai. It was dry and barren, rocky country, with little pasture for the cattle and no place to grow food. What a place, muttered some. Why has he brought us here? If we'd gone north instead of south, we would have been at Canaan by now, said the others. What does he think we're going to grow here? asked a farmer, comparing the dry, sandy soil with the rich loam of the Nile Valley. And how does he think we're going to keep our cattle alive on this poor scrubland, asked another. Their complaints were catching, and soon everybody was grumbling. Then, as food supplies got lower and lower, the whole congregation turned on Moses and Aaron, as they always did when in trouble. Forgetting all the miracles God had wrought for them in Egypt, at the Red Sea and at Marah, they cried out, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the flesh pots and we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. It was a very silly thing to say, but they had been slaves for so long, they didn't know any better. 
even though they had seen God do many, many wonderful things for them, they still did not understand him or trust him. Their chief concern was how to get enough to eat. They thought they would be willing to be slaves again, if only they could just smell those flesh pots once more. Moses told God what the people were saying and asked him what to do. God promised he would rain bread from heaven. That evening, just as the people were wondering what to eat, thousands of birds flew into the camp. They were quails and they flew so low that it was easy to catch them and kill them. Everybody had a good supper and some perhaps remembered to thank God for looking after them one more time. But what about breakfast? There was no stores where they might go and buy shredded wheat or cornflakes and no milkmen to leave milk outside each tent. What sort of food would God provide in the morning? Many wondered. Would he send quails again? No. Instead, he sent something quite different. Early next day, as soon as the dew had gone, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing, as small as a hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. How gingerly they picked up the first little piece, with thumb and finger to taste it. It was nice. It had a sweet taste, like wafers made with honey, and they liked it. How good it must have seemed to all those poor hungry people, especially the boys and girls. Morning by morning, without fail, they found the manna there, right there, outside the tent doors. All they had to do was to gather it up and eat it. For the next 40 years, this was their main source of food. There was one strange thing about it, however. It appeared on the ground only six days of the week. It was never there on the seventh day, not one little piece. Why? Because God wanted to teach these people to keep his holy Sabbath day. Adam and Eve kept the Sabbath in the beginning. So had Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. When the children of Israel went into Egypt at Joseph's invitation, they had kept it there too. But when they'd been slaves, they had not been able to keep it. During that time, many came to think it didn't matter and that God didn't expect them to keep the Sabbath day. Some had even forgotten which day it was. So now, by the miracle of the manna, God sought to bring his people back into the right and true way. Every Friday, the sixth day, preparation day, they were told to go out and gather a double portion of manna, enough to last over the Sabbath. Marvelously, the manna gathered on Friday kept for two days, whereas when too much was gathered on any other day, it quickly spoiled. This plus the fact that no manna appeared on the seventh day let the people see which day God wanted them to keep. It was the seventh day. Let the people see which God, which day God wanted to keep for the Sabbath. It was clear. There simply couldn't be any doubt about it. It was the seventh day and none other. At first there were some who believed God meant what he said. These went out on the seventh day. They didn't believe that he was serious. So they went out on the seventh day for to gather manna. And they found none. God was displeased with them, and he said, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread for two days. Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. This lesson taught one every week for forty years forever fixed in the minds of the Israelites, the right day on which to keep the Sabbath. 
by the manna God said to them 2,080 times, that's 52 multiplied by 40. This day, the Sabbath day, is my Sabbath. And he did so in order that they may never forget it, nor have any excuse for making a mistake about it. They never did forget. Even now, 3,000 years later, they have not forgotten it. How could we? How could anybody? So you see, children, I certainly, this week, learnt a lesson loud and clear. The moral of the story was so clear. We grumble and we moan and we forget to be appreciative. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Thank you, children. It is now time for our tithes and offerings, where we take part in returning to God that which he has blessed us with. And uh, as we consider and reflect on this service, I would like to share a passage of scripture found in 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 10 to 16. 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 10 to 16. And the Bible says, So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. My brothers and sisters, in a time where we seem to have our income not being what it was in times past before the crisis, I am aware that some other brothers and sisters have lost their jobs and have had their working hours reduced. But God has always been a constant and faithful provider in times of plenty and in times of little. So as we remember his goodness, let us be faithful in returning that which belongs to him so that there might be food in the house of God. Let us pray. Eternal Father in heaven, we are grateful that you are our God, the only living God. Father, you see us in times of need. You provide for us in such times as this. Father, we are grateful and thankful for your provisions. And Lord, we are blessed to have an opportunity to bring unto you that which already belongs unto you, Father. May you bless our homes, may you bless our households. Even in the midst of this crisis, we are grateful that you continue to provide for us. Father, bless your people, those that worry, for they think they do not have much. May you remind them, Lord, that you have their lives in your hands and that you are a faithful provider. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading is coming from the second book of Corinthians, chapter 9, 
verses 6 to 9. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness in Jews forever. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Our dear loving Father who art in heaven, we are so grateful that we have come boldly before your throne of grace. We do not deserve to be calling upon your name, but we are grateful that your Son, Jesus Christ, represents us before you. And it is him whom you see, not our wretched souls. Father, we pray that you forgive us all unrighteousness. We have wronged you in so many ways, but we come before you, Lord, that we be cleansed. There are so many things that we have done as an individual and as a church. We have said things we shouldn't have said. We have touched things we shouldn't have touched. We have perceived evil things within our hearts, that which we should not have done. But Lord, we realize that without you, we are forever lost. So humbly we come before your throne of grace, asking for your mercy. In a special way, Lord, I want to present before you those who are sick amongst us. We pray, Lord, that you continue to touch them. We are grateful, Lord, that you know them by their names. As they are in pain, asking to be healed, we pray, Lord, that you touch them again. We pray for the second touch. There are those who are without accommodation. We bring them before you, Lord that you assist them. There are those who are recovering from various illnesses. We equally pray, Lord, that you continue to be with them. And Father, as we are about to hear good news from your throne of grace above, we pray, Lord, that you will be with the preacher. We pray, Lord, that you purify her thoughts. We pray, Lord, that every word that is going to proceed out of her mouth is refined by you, and that is coming from your throne of grace above. And when all is said and done, we pray, Father, that our names be written in your book of life. For when you come, what a joy will it be to see everybody at Perry Beach's church saved. To see, Lord, when that role is called upon yonder, that we will all be present. But until then, Father, may your Holy Spirit continue to abide in us. And we know, Father, that our prayer will be answered, for you promised that anything that we ask in your name, it will be done. So, Lord, we pray that you continue to abide with us and never leave us, O oh Lord, for we are weak, but thou art strong. We pray and we ask all this in the name of our loving Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom only you are pleased. In his holy name we pray. Amen.
Hello and welcome to Perry Beach's SDA Church. It is such a privilege and an honor to be here on your screens and just to be worshiping with you in your home, in your car, wherever you are listening to at this present moment. One of the beautiful things about you know, doing recordings is that anytime, any place, the word is accessible to you. So my name is Rejoice and I'll be preaching um, serving and action. So before I begin, I'm just going to start with a word of prayer and then we can go straight and hear what the Lord has to say. Let's pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for this Sabbath day. Thank you, Lord, that we can cast all our cares on you because you care for us. Father, I pray, Lord, that right now, whatever's going on in our minds that is distracting us from being fully present with you, Lord, may we just lay it down and not pick it up, Lord, for the rest of the day. May we take full advantage of this day as during the week we may have been doing various things and trying to keep up with so many things. But I just pray, Lord, we just give you some undivided attention. May the word that is spoken be sown on good ground. It may it also be applicable to every single individual in their own way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to be preaching on the sermon title is called Self Versus Action. To be honest, I don't know about you, but you must be feeling tired and drained and you must be thinking, I don't know why I'm feeling this way because all I'm doing is I'm at home, I'm not really doing that much. Yes, maybe I'm going to work, but everything is closed. So why am I feeling this way? And if we can all be completely honest, even sometimes just even attending church online in itself can be very tiring. You know, you just think, oh, you know what? I could do with a bit of extra time in bed. Ah, Sabbath school, 9.30, but during the week, I stayed up a bit late. I was trying to catch up with things. Ah, it doesn't really matter. I can just watch the replay. You know, all these things start going through our mind, you know. I feel like now as the year has progressed, we've kind of fallen, and I'm also speaking for myself here, also fallen into this, you know, this tiredness, this weariness, and this, you know, this, you know, just this way of life now has, you know, also just started to kind of get under our skin and we are tired. And, you know, I was researching and I was thinking, you know, with, you know, with the way that things are, it's a great opportunity for much needed rest. So why, why am I so tired? Why is everyone that I talk to saying, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. But the crazy thing about it is as I was reading on this and tiredness and I was, you know, looking at various journals, you know, medical journals, I found an amazing discovery. You have to listen to this. Many doctors reported that humans are hardwired for growth and stimulation. So this means that without a purpose for each day, we will feel defeated, lethargic or even depressed because we're not doing anything and because we're just going with the flow in and out, day in and day out, you know, we just feel almost defeated like a new day, it feels the same day, you know, and that's just the way that we've been going in this cycle. And one particular doctor uh, called Beresford said that, you know, as for some people this can lead into depression, but this also leads into low motivation and this also leads to stress. And especially now with the pandemic going on, it's even leading to higher prolonged periods of stress because we're having prolonged periods of just sitting and in action. And this is reducing our tolerance to normal activities which we'd normally find joy in doing. Meaning that, you know, our muscles, one, if you're not exercising and if you're not doing things to stimulate your growth and you know to keep you going your muscles are also starting to feel worn out they're also doing that um, it also means that the way that you judge things the way you see the world the way that you perceive things you know it's very very high alert and all of this is is producing a lot of adrenaline in your body it's pumping this adrenaline and your body is just tired and you're just lethargic so I've, upon reading this, I thought to myself, okay, so this is very interesting. And I thought, hmm, this also really, really reminds me of the gospel. And, you know, 
with all this sensory overload going on of being, you know, with Zoom on church. And I also have to say the communications department has been doing an absolutely amazing job. So we have to give them their flowers and we pray that God gives them a double portion of blessing for ensuring that things are going on. So I'm sure they're tired as well. But it also really reminded me as well of the gospel in the, es in the essence that naturally, it is in our nature to want to stay the same and just to consume things and just to relax and lay back, especially with the way that our culture is. But what the gospel calls us to do is to change and to serve. And upon also reading the research that I was finding in terms of being tired around this time, one of the many recommendations that many um, psychologists and doctors were encouraging was to also get up and to serve and to be in action. And this looks like either exercising, this looks like you know serving your time to charitable causes or organization, checking up on people, ensuring that you're using your time to serve and not just be in this regular routine that you're in. And then as I was reading the Bible, I went to uh, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 12. So if we turn our Bibles to 2 Corinthians 9 verse 12, and it says plainly what the duty of, you know, individual members of the church as we all are, this is what it says, let him give not grudgingly or of necessity for God loveth a cheerful giver. And also the promise of God is that he which soweth sparingly shall also reap sparingly and he who soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. And you must be thinking, okay, so what am I serving rejoice and what am I giving? And I was, as I was reading this, I was, I was really encouraged and I, uh, and I really thought about this. And one of the things that we can give is our time and our efforts and even of ourself. You know, during this time, many of us have had to learn many hard lessons of the economy, probably before we never even knew what the economy was, but now we have had to learn all of these things. And we we're always on the go and, you know, we took many things for granted and now things are just happening and we have all this extra time to, to kind of focus on things we'd maybe forgotten. And maybe this is the time that God is calling us to also realize and also not to forget to also let go of self and to serve using our time. We are to engage, you know, in this work seriously because we know that this is what God has called us to do, to give, not grudgingly, but out of necessity for God loves a cheerful giver. And one of the ways that we can give is of our service and of our time. We're also to remember that, you know, during this time period that we're in, you know, it, it's, I think it has kind of given us a wake up call to see that we are to give and to store our treasures in heaven rather than on earth. And this means going through self-denial of earthly pleasures um, and also building up the kingdom of God, even in this very pandemic. And I think one of the mistakes that we have made is thinking, oh, I will consume, I will watch videos, I will relax more at home. But all of these things make us, make us really tired. But God is calling us to give. And one of the ways... Um, that God is calling us to give is with our time and giving us and giving up of ourselves. So if we look at John chapter 12, verse one to 11, and I'm gonna read in your hearing, it says, then Jesus six days before the Passover came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead whom he raised from the dead. Then they made him a supper and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odour of ointment. Then the Lord said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was this thought ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then Jesus said, let her alone against the day of my burying has she kept this. For the poor you will always have with you, but with me you will not always have. 
Much of the Jews therefore knew that he was there and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but they might also see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by that reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. And here we can see that, you know, Mary came and she had her oil and she was ready to pour and to give to Jesus. And Jesus also made a point that, you know, um, we always have the poor among us. And so and now during this pandemic and just during the time that we're in, there are so many people that we can give our time to, so many people that we can give to, um, whether that's volunteering for crisis services, maybe volunteering to help out at church, even though it's not your department or your duty, but lending an extra hand, all of these things, you know, giving up of ourselves. And Jesus also tells us that if we love him, we will keep his commandments and that greater love has no man than this, that he would lay his life down for his friends. Jesus gave his life for us and what, you know, we will be willing to give to him. You know, just a few minutes of our time just during the week can make a tremendous difference in ensuring that we are giving and we're being like Christ. I know our resources and the way that things are are very, very limited during this time. But just giving up ourself, you know, that's denying that self and saying, do you know what, just for a couple of hours or maybe just this week, I'll just do what I can. Maybe I'll just... um, volunteer because right now they are desperate need of crisis volunteers and many many different things that we can just give even an hour a week to just to help out and one of the um one of the people that i'm really really admired by um is by mary um the, the sister of um of martha because she um for her to put you know that precious ointment and to give of herself It was very, very giving and it was very, very um, expensive. And, you know, it was everything that she knew and she knew that Jesus was worth it, even though she knew it was going to cost her a little bit. Now, in that society, just to put someone's, um, to put oil on someone's feet, you know, was quite a thing. But then to wipe your hair with it was a completely a whole new different concept altogether because during that time as well women were not allowed to show their hair they had to cover their hair so she really had to go against the grain of what felt comfortable for her to ensure that she gave and to ensure that she you know she really gave her all to Christ and really appreciated him whilst he was still there and I honestly believe with all my heart that when we come to know Jesus and who he really, really is, it will humble us and we will know that time is also of the essence and we will also know that the time that we are now, there are many, many people who also need our services. There are departments in church that need our services to still be running. You know, there is ADRA, our charity, have you even thought about? And this is also myself too, have we thought about giving to them as well and extending our services to people that are still in need instead of us just sitting back and consuming and taking everything in. One of the people that I'm really, like I said, I really admired um, Mary for this act. She went against the grain of what was comfortable within society, against what was comfortable, probably even for herself, to go and approach Jesus, you know, a man, and to say in front of everybody else, in front of all these other men, I'm going to pour, you know, everything that I can, and I'm going to give myself to Jesus. It must have been, you know, a very difficult for her to do as well but she knew the cost and she knew that giving to Jesus and expressing how grateful she was was you know the worth the cost of all of these things and I also thoroughly believe as well that the better we know Jesus the more intimate as well and the more humbling um our experience with him will be. And we will also realize that God has a heart for his children. God has a heart for people out there. And so many people during this time, they are fed up. Just as you are fed up, many, many other people are also fed up. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? 
even Jesus himself as well. Um, you know, so the thing is with, you know, the giving of ourselves, it doesn't necessarily have to be strangers, but even people in our immediate care. When was the last time you really thoroughly checked on your brother and sister in Christ to see how they were doing? Um, even Jesus himself um, in John 13 verse 4, um, he decided to wash the feet of the disciples, which is a very, very lowly act for him to do, especially him being the Christ and you know, them just being disciples. But he extended himself and the disciples, I believe their faces must have been shocked, you know, thinking, wow, this, you know, this Christ showing such an act of humility and, you know, he's washing our feet. And as revealed in Matthew 20, verse 28, it says, he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And I believe that's an amazing principle that we can also take from there as well, that we are not here just to be served. We are not here just to sit back and allow everybody to do everything for us, but we are also called to serve and to extend our services. And probably the reason why we are tired and feeling lethargic is many of us are not doing the very acts that Jesus asked us to do, and we're not being like him in the act of serving. We are just sitting, we are just relaxed, we don't know what's going on going on we're wondering why we're tired but you know our bodies the way that we are made even according to the gospel we're not made to be passive this is an action movement christianity is an action movement it's not a passive movement we don't just sit there and we just you know dilly dally around even the word of god says go go ye therefore and make disciples go ye therefore and do this make sure you look after the widows make sure you take care of one another those are all action words those are doing words and i truly truly believe if we extend ourselves God will really show himself to be true and will be like Christ. And this will in turn ignite and just revive us. It will push us. It will just give us a newfound love because we are unlocking a character of Christ that many of us have, you know, failed to look at and analyze. And, you know, as I read more of this, of, of what Jesus did as well, I was... Um, really, you know, in awe of, you know, his humility. And I said, wow, you know, as his followers, we are really to emulate him. You know, we have to serve one another in lowliness of heart and mind and seeking to build each other up because we really don't know the next time we'll all be gathered in our numbers and in our masses. And we have to keep the love and we have to keep the connection. We have to still be building the community. And if you look at, let's, let's go to the book of um, Acts chapter 6, and we'll look at 1 um, verse 7. And what I like about this chapter is it shows some of the traits that were exhibited by the first deacons of the Bible, um, called the seven leaders. And it also talks about, you know, serving and action, you know, this thing of self versus action and, you know, just sitting down. And I'm going to read in your hearing, it says... In those days, when the disciples were increasing in number, the Grecian Jews began to grumble against the Hebraic Jews because, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So as we are increasing in number now, the, the, the word is going out on the internet, it's being distributed to thousands, to millions, to billions, you know? Um, many of us are grumbling and many people are still being overlooked. And verse two, so the 12 summoned all the disciples and said, it is unacceptable for us to neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, brothers, select from among you seven men confirmed to be full of the spirit and of wisdom and we will appoint this responsibility to them and devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So you can see how uh, important this was. They had to select people to ensure that others were still being served and not being overlooked. And then verse five, this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, as well as Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, 
Pemenus and Nicholas from the Antioch and converts to Judaism, and they presented these seven to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. So the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew rapidly, and a great number of priests became obedient to the faith. Why? Because they took the time to really ensure that they were serving and they made this a dedicated thing before the Lord. And these characteristics as well are a result of a love and a relationship with God, which should in turn move us and call us to, to action as well. Now, to also um, further give you a good background and understanding of the story and the roles of service, I would also really encourage you to, to read um, Acts of the Apostles as well by Ellen G. White, she, especially chapter nine. She really gives a good breakdown of the importance of service and how that impacts the church and the growing of the church as well. And one thing as well, which I really have to highlight in your hearing as well, is that Satan knew that so long as the church, we the church, were united and working together as one body, combining all our gifts and talents, he would be powerless to check the progress of the gospel. So he took you know, advantage of former habits of thought, making people just relax, people overlooking other people in the hope that he might be able to introduce the church into elements of disillusion and disunion. And this is also in Acts of Apostles as well. So as the disciples were multiplying, so as we are multiplying in our numbers, you know, people are getting to hear the gospel online. You know, um, Satan succeeded in arousing the suspicions of some who had formerly been in the habit of looking with jealousy on their brethren in the faith and finding fault with spiritual leaders. In this case, it was the case of food distribution and unfairness. And in Christ, there is no you know, inequality. We all should be you know, taken care of. Yet Satan had succeeded in arousing suspicion which would cause disharmony in the church. No one or even one set of men could continue to bear these burdens alone without jeopardizing the future of the church. Um, even now as well, um, at Perry Beaches, we're getting larger in numbers and there is a necessity for further distribution of the responsibilities and of things that need to be done. And we all need to get involved one way or another, even if it's just one you know, week of the month or just, which is basically just one day. One, one, just one can do tremendous amount of difference. And in this case, as the apostles, they were led by the Holy Spirit to outline a plan for the better organization of all the working forces in their church. And the time had come when the spiritual leaders, they had to um, you know, basically look and, and see how the church was functioning and how they should relieve you know, the task of you know, ensuring that people were getting the food that they need and still carry on preaching the gospel, still ensuring that the needs, the physical needs, the emotional needs, all of those needs were being met. And remember, the church is a body. So I don't know if you, if you know in your body, when something is not quite working right, everything else just doesn't feel right. So even if it's a small part, so even if it's one department or your one arm or your one finger, when something isn't right, you just don't feel right. And it's the same within the body of Christ. When we're neglecting action, when we're neglecting to serve, when we're neglecting you know, to spend time with God and do all of those things, something just doesn't feel right. And we become drained and now we are tired because something isn't, isn't quite right. Hence why the, uh, the Bible refers to the church as a body because we all you know, move together. And when all of these things were happening, you know, it became very, very difficult. And there was all this dis you know, disunion within the church and all of these different things were coming about because something was being neglected and not being overlooked. And when this happened, the church saw a need to ensure that you know, things were being done. 
So I don't know what you might need to do at home. Maybe it's taking that time just to pray and ask God, God, what can I do? What can be done for me to ensure that I'm doing my part as the little finger in the body of Christ to ensure that I'm working properly, that I'm moving correctly? Is there something that I need to do? Maybe I know that me and sister so-and-so or me and some of my friends, we're really passionate in this area. We're good at this area. Why don't we ensure that we work together as a team and as a body and build each other up to do good things and to do good works because we love the Lord and ensure that the body is moving and the body feels good and the body is functioning at its optimal best. And, you know, when the appointment of the seven deacons was done, it really provided a great blessing to the church. And there's a lesson we can learn here. It might just take just even seven of us in the church, just a few of us, just to ensure that we are serving and we are working together and we are giving where we can, whether that's in your church community, whether that's in the wider community at large, just you giving of yourself can make a tremendous blessing. You know, little is much when God is in it. And when two or three are gathered, I'm telling you, God is surely there and he would do a tremendous thing. And when, as soon as they did this thing and they were united and they came with the plan, when a few of them came together and gathered together, an amazing thing happened, as it says in the word of God. The word of God increased, it was growing in numbers. You know, many people, you know, started multiplying and being motivated in the faith. You know, they started to do many other services. They were able to even, um, encourage the priests as well to also be of the faith. So sometimes by you just being in action and you serving and doing something, it would just trigger a light in somebody else to think, oh, do you know what? Why don't I do something? Can I join you? That's a great idea. Let's do it together. You never know what you just choosing to come out of the status quo, to do something that's against the grain of what you have been used to for the past year. Just one action, you have no idea how much you can do to encourage somebody else and you you can spread the church, you can spread the word of God on fire. And the organization of the church at Jerusalem, you know, served as a many, such as a, a many great models that we can all emulate as well, which is to feed the flock of God, to ensure that we're all doing our part to ensure people are being served and being looked after. And even just think of it now as well, in, you know, just give you a practical example. You wouldn't be sitting in your house right now and listening to, you know, to the sermon and listening to the beautiful singing that we've, you know, we've just had, listening to all the wonderful service if it was not for people dedicating their time to saying, I'm going to serve and I'm going to go against, you know, the grain of what maybe I want to do and what I'm comfortable with, you know? There would be no Sabbath school going on for anybody if we didn't have the teachers. We would never enjoy the fellowship and, you know, the special music without, you know, the wonderful servants of God and the wonderful people who make this worship possible, who make it possible for you to have a Sabbath around the globe with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And one thing about God is that he is not the God of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. And that's in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 13. And God requires that even in our tiredness, even in your weariness, even in you just lying in bed right now, probably just listening to me, even in all of those things, even in all the things that we go through, God still wants us and still requires us to be in action, even in the hard circumstances. He still requires that we make peace, that we promote peace, and that we promote still being like Christ, even when it's unconventional for us to do so. And he desires that this gospel be preached towards all the four corners of the world. He told us to go, go ye therefore. There wasn't a prerequisite, there wasn't a go ye therefore, unless there's a pandemic. There wasn't a go ye therefore unless there's this. Because even wherever we are, 
whatever you're doing. And the amazing thing is that we've become so advanced in, in such a good way now that we have mead social media, we have TV, you have Facebook, you can make telephone calls. All of these are wonderful avenues that can make you go ye therefore and touch so many people. We um, have to ensure that we lay down self and put self aside. And I'm just going to read from 2 Corinthians 9, 11 to 15, which summarizes it all perfectly, that serving is all for the glory of God and that he will reward us when we serve him. And more so than just rewarding us, on even on a physical level, just the, bio, the biology of how we are made. I'm pretty sure when we do these things, God, you know, is all knowing and he knows how we function as humans. And I know deep down God thought, you know what, you know, in order for us to be rejuvenated and to keep going, as you know, the scientists said, we have to be moving, we have to be called to action. And it says in uh, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 15, you will be enriched in every way to be generous on every occasion and your giving through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For this ministry of service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but it is an overflowing of many expressions of thanksgiving to God. Because of the proof of this ministry provides, the saints will glorify God for your obedience to confession of the gospel of Christ and for the generosity of your contribution to them and to all others. And their prayers for you will express their affection for you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Don't get weary in well-doing. And I just want to encourage you right now in your home, wherever you are, in your bed, I don't know what you're doing. Maybe you're just getting ready now. You're just finally getting dressed. I don't know what you're doing. Maybe you're having your lunch. Let us not get weary in well-doing. The answer to many of our problems is because we're simply neglecting looking at Christ. We always talk about what would Jesus do? Well, you know, Jesus is like this. Jesus would serve others. But many of us have really, myself included, we've greatly neglected one of the very fundamental characteristics of who Jesus was. And we've just been sitting at home, not doing anything. You probably haven't talked to anyone from church in a while. You've looked at your phone. You've probably read the WhatsApp messages. You put it to the side and you haven't even thought, hmm, maybe this week I'm a bit free. Can I, let me just see what department might need my help or maybe where I can extend and see if I can just come and even do the scripture reading or something just to serve, just to keep the church going, just to encourage you know, each other to keep going. And more so, we're complaining that we're tired, now we're getting all these aches and pains, but it's because we're going against the very nature of who God created us to be. We're going against the very nature of biology, which is to serve. As I um, read to you earlier on all these journals, like I said to you earlier, humans are hardwired for growth and stimulation, and it's, uh, and it's always a battle of self versus action. But I want to encourage you today, I want to encourage us today to just think of one thing or one way, just grab a friend, phone a friend, text a friend, and let's find a way to serve. We have been saved to serve in season and out of season. And it is my prayer that God will move the very heartstrings of your heart and encourage you and inspire you to find a way to serve him today and to move you to action so you can grow and be stimulated and be the best you to bring glory to Christ. Let us pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the word that you have spoken to us. Father, I just want to pray for forgiveness of our sins. Many of us, Lord, have just become accustomed to the way things are. What initially became a wake-up call, Lord, to get our lives together, we've become accustomed to it, Lord, and we're like frogs sitting in boiling water, just cooking and dying. Meanwhile, we're in danger, but we've just become so accustomed to it because it's just how the way things are. Father, I pray, Lord, that you will inspire us. The very fire that you put in our hearts when we first gave our lives to you, the very fire that you gave us, Lord, when things are not going right in the word, Father, it's an ember, and I just pray, Lord, that you just set it on fire, Lord, that we may not become weary in well-doing. It's a battle, Lord, of serving and action, but Lord, you have called us and you have saved us so we can serve 
this gospel, Lord, is not a selfish gospel. And Lord, we've made it about self and we've made it very, very selfish. So Father, I pray that you forgive us of our sins. And Lord, you may help us to see ways that we can serve those around us and encourage each other in the faith so that your word, Lord, will grow and it will ignite as you have said in your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As we know your gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on earth as thou art calling, do not pass me by. I hope and pray that you have been blessed today and we would like to thank our God for being faithful by using our speaker for the day, Sister Rejoice Huyana. And as you go into the week that lies ahead, may the blessings of the Lord go with you. May he keep you and may he protect you. May he grant you favor in the sight of men and in his presence. God bless you.